I'm here now, and I'm ready to go. That song ended before I thought it was going to end. Good to be here today. This is Pastor Mike, and I am online, and I am live with you today, coming to you from our top secret broadcasting slash jelly factory. Don't ask me what that means. I just made it up. Good to be with you today. Uh, I've got a lot of things to talk about, as I usually do, none of which were planned before I came in this morning, uh, and, and including the scripture that I'm going to read you. I want you to take your Bibles. We're going to start right with the Word of God, and I, um, I, my Bible was just open to this page, and I was looking at it, and I'm going, that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, I got something I'm going to read you, that, something that dawned on me yesterday studying the just reading through the book of Galatians I I looked at something right in Galatians chapter 1 and I mean all of a sudden it just made sense uh, the scripture that I want you to look at is Psalm 120 and I now remember why I had my Bible open to Psalm 120 I was looking at Psalm 119 and discussing with some gentlemen who were sort of in a little small group secret conclave about Psalm 119, uh, patterns that are in it. Of course, obviously, it's divided up into 22 sections. The number 22 is the number for revelation. The number 22 is the number of letters in Hebrew, Aleph Beth, which is their alphabet. That's why you see, somebody asked me that the other day. I thought everybody knew this. Um, but then <clears throat> you, you realize that we're not living in um, a, a nation that knows much about the Bible. They were pointing to the Aleph and the Beth there in Psalm 119. They're saying, what is that? I said, it's the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Um, if you buy a can of alphabet soup in Jerusalem, that's what you're going to find in there. You're going to find little Aleph, Beths, and so on. I don't know. I just made that up. <clears throat> but anyway, I was talking to our secret conclave, uh, guys that are just looking at uh, using the software, King James Pure Bible Search dot com, no, Pure Bible Search dot com, and they just find all these wonderful, neat little patterns in the King James Bible. And I gave them like a little assignment because Psalm 119, every e each one of the 22 sections says something about the Word of God. It calls it the statutes, judgments, testimonies, precepts, the Word, etc., etc., etc. And, um, I thought it would be interesting, and you can get on in on this too. You can send it to an email, pastormichaelonline at gmail dot com, um, and just kind of tell me what you see in here. How many times is the word precepts in Psalm one nineteen? How many times is the word testimonies? Things like that. And uh, <clears throat> so that's why I had it open there. I was I was looking at it, and Psalm one twenty grabbed my attention. It says, "In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and He heard me." Deliver my soul, O Lord, from, and this is what grabbed me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. And um, <clears throat> yesterday I was reading the book of uh, Galatians, and um, I was never got out of chapter 1 until something new, something brand new hit me. And that's what I love about believing in the Word of God that it is the Spirit of God. They are the words of Jesus. They are infallible. They are incorruptible. They're right in everything they say. And if you'll just quit trying to prove the Bible wrong and just accept what you see in the King James, God will open up your eyes to a lot of things. And in you read it once, God will show you something. Read it again, God will show you something else. I don't know how many times I've read the book of Galatians. Never, it never made the connection before. And uh, <clears throat> let, me, let me read this, though. Um, speaking of lying lips, I'm included in that. Uh, this is an email. Um, I won't give his name, but he's correcting me. <clears throat> <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me. I realized this morning that spring has now sprung in the state of Missouri. I went outside this morning. My car was green, and I don't drive a green car. It was covered over with pollen. The trees are waking up, ready to clap their hands once again and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. 
And um, I, I sneezed in my sleep last night. I don't think I've ever done that. Um, at this time of year, at the onset of all the pollen all over the place, I sneeze. I get a, a stopped up, sniffly, runny nose. That's what happens to me. So if you hear me, <clears throat> things like that today, or if I have to sneeze, uh, you'll know why. Um, this guy corrected me, and he did. He actually corrected me. Um, I got into a hurry the other day, passed a mic online, and I put a story, printed it out, laid it in my notes, and I don't know how much time I spent with it, but um, apparently the story was wrong. And I, I, I am aware that there are websites on the Internet that are parody websites, which means that they make stuff up and put it out there and they tell you that it's a parody site some people will read articles from it and go I knew that I knew that was happening I knew that one of the stories that is not true it's a parody um, is and this was put out I think by the onion or one of these other parody websites was that the Catholic Church hired JK Rowling to retranslate the Bible and, and, it, and when you look at it, knowing it's a parody, you're going, that's pretty good, okay? Not funny. Um, but people pass that around like it's true. They're going, I knew that. I knew the Catholic Church was like full of witchcraft and, and J.K. Rowling was working for the Vatican. I knew it. It's not really true. And apparently that was the case with this story. Uh, please, Pastor Mike, check his... Uh, Check the source in regards to a story about a sleeper cell in Malakoff Diggins State Park in Nevada County, California. The story came from a tabloid called the Nevada County Scooper that states clearly on their info page that they write bogus articles for humor only. <laughs> Just saying we need to present the truth or all or we will all look foolish. I like you. Because I agree with you. Um, here is a link to the Scooper site. Um, this should clear things up. I live in Nevada County and can tell you that there is enough stuff going on in this county that is true. We don't need a goofy tabloid that makes us look even worse. Thanks. And I won't give the uh, young lady's name. Anyway, I appreciate you sending me that. And that one did. It slipped through the filters. Um, I usually will look and make sure that I'm not dealing with a parody site. One, um, uh, one new age based article that somebody had sent me to read, I was actually reading it because they were talking about DNA and frequencies and changing, altering DNA and so on. And um, they got into a place, the, the guy, this guy was dead serious. He was basing, he was a new age guy, and he was basing his, his theories and premises off of other articles and things that he had seen on the internet. And uh, he got to a place where he said it had been proven that encoded in the DNA of humans were actual Bible verses, verses out of the scriptures. Now, that caught my attention. And he went on to quote... Um, the source for this, talking about how they found Bible verses encoded in people's DNA. And I'm going, okay, well, the source for his material was a, a university called the um, Wyoming Institute of Technology. And so I'm going, boy, I've, I've heard of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They're on the forefront of just about everything. I have not heard of the Wyoming Institute of Technology. They have a website, Wyoming Institute of Technology, W-I-T, WIT. It is a parody website, and they wrote this fake, bogus article about scientists finding Bible verses in the DNA code. And I'm going, okay, yeah, it's, it's a joke. It's not, it's not real. That didn't really happen. But this guy didn't prove his sources, and he, he's basing one of these major theories about DNA and how it can be changed and altered and this and that and the other on a website that is not even true. In fact, it tells everybody, we're not true. We're lying. We're joking. We're kidding around. We're fooling. 
and people fall for it. And I fell for it the other day. So I appreciate um, I appreciate you catching that and sending that to me. Um, I will try to be diligent next time around. Uh, Psalm 120 again. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. That should be everybody's, every born-again Christian's prayer is what that should be. God, I have been lied to so many times, I'm tired of it. And I'll tell you this, we get people um, writing to us, calling us, uh, sit down and they'll tell us, uh, they'll come visit, they'll sit down and tell us, say, Pastor, we went from this group, we, we were Hebrew roots, we're telling you everything that you say about them is true, in spades it's true. We were part of the charismatic. We went and had, we were anointed by certain of these guys. We went to this rally and we went, we're part of this group over here. And none of it settled our soul. It's just like it was all lies. And I, I love that testimony. I love it when people <clears throat> will, will get in touch with us and say, when we saw your videos and we started looking at the King James Bible, we stopped right here. And we're not going anywhere else. The King James Bible is the Word of God. Now, I don't take credit for that in the sense that it was the King James Bible that made them stop right here, not Mike Hoggard. If people stop and listen to Mike Hoggard and say, this is it, I found it, that's, that's it, I, everything Mike says, if they stop on me, they'll move on at some point because that's how they do it. And I love those stories where people will say, my faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. They found the word of God and, and they're done. They're done looking. They're going to start reading this book like never before. But what troubles me is the people that are still out there who would have stopped at the King James Bible, but someone, Satan, diverted their attention and ate the word up as soon as it was, it was out there. They read some website or watched some YouTube video from some wolf that was telling them that the King James was the Illuminati code book, that it was written by Francis Bacon, and all of these other lies and deceitful things to steer conspiracy people away from the word of God. They're actually telling them, you want a conspiracy? Biggest conspiracy in the whole world King James Bible. Why, that book's just so full of Masonic footprints in it. It's not even funny. It's just got handshakes in every verse in it. It's written by the Masons. Masons la love that book. That's why they got a King James Bible in their hall. That's, that's a Mason book. And so they'll go, oh, oh. man, I was kind of counting on that to be right. So they move on, and they're still wondering. And they'll never find rest. They'll probably end up Jim Staley somewhere or some other wolf. And they, they won't stick with the word of God. And so God's true people, they've been out here. They went to this. They looked at that. They were a part of this. They were a member of this. And finally, God brought them to the place. After they had been lied to so many times, they come to the realization of the truth through the word of God, the infallible. My, thy word is true from the beginning. And the spirit of God draws them there and 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 deals with them and speaks to their heart and says, this is it right here. Stop. Stay here. Just start reading this, and I'll show you stuff that none of these other people will ever know. And you are, verse 2, you've asked God, deliver my soul from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Let me, uh, let me show you what I, what I landed on um, yesterday. Take your, I'm going to save my place here because I'm not done in Psalm 120. I realized I'd just realized I hadn't hit the record button again. Anyway, but you're not King James only. You're Paul only. Because you tell people, well, we only read Paul. We only get our doctrine from the Apostle Paul. I, I even heard one. If I mentioned his name, you'd know him. I'm not going to. I like his work on the King James Bible. But he said in a message, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not for us in this dispensation, in this age. They're not for us. That is not, that is not what your Bible says. I can, well, I, I won't say I can destroy that. Um, let's see here. There we go. Is that it? Is that it? Yeah, 1 Timothy 6.3. 
Now remember, they say, they say that the gospel and what Jesus said in those gospels and the doctrine he taught is not for us in this dispensation. Here's what Paul only said. 1 Timothy 6, 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. Paul said it. Paul said, if you don't consent to the wholesome words, the words that Jesus Christ said, you're proud and you know nothing. I'm done. I believe what Paul said, period, the end. There's, I don't need... Anybody who has to write a book that's actually about the Bible, that's actually bigger than the Bible, something ain't right there. Just tell everybody, read, just read the Bible, read the King James Bible. God will teach you what he wants to teach you. So anyway, here is, here is Paul only now talking about the real gospel and another gospel, which is at the core and the heart of ultra or hyper dispensationalists they say that there are other gospels at other times here's what paul said i marvel verse six that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of christ unto another gospel and in galatians what was the other gospel law keeping works that's the whole gist of Galatians, was that the other gospel that they had been removed to was a works-based gospel for Jews. That's what it was. And Parvel said, uh, Paul said, I marvel, Parvel. Parvel said, Maul. There. Paul said, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you. It's not that they just changed their doctrine. They left Christ. That's what he said. You are removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And he said, verse 7, which is not another. The word gospel, according to the King James Bible, means good tidings. Compare Luke chapter 4 with Isaiah 61, I think. When you compare those two places, you'll see that the word gospel is good tidings. And when Paul says it's another gospel, he said it's not another gospel, it's not good tidings. And I agree with that. It's not, a, it's not good news to tell people. It's possible now that you might actually make it into heaven if you perform everything that God tells you to perform as far as the law is concerned. But if you break that law, I'm sorry, but you're just, you're going to lose your salvation. And I'm sitting here going, well, that was the problem I had before I got saved. A lot of people think that they are going to please God if they just straighten themselves out and start doing right and live right and quit smoking and drinking and doing drugs and running from one bed to another. Yeah, if I, if I get my life straightened out, then I'll be a good Christian, and that's not right. There ain't a one of us that has straightened their own life out. Either God does it or he doesn't, period, the end. And it's not a gospel if you tell people that they have to overcome every obstacle. They cannot fall. They cannot break any of God's commandments because if they do, they're going to lose their salvation. That's not good news. That's no gospel. I don't know why they call it that, but they do. They say another gospel is law keeping. Got to keep the law. Got to overcome. And Paul said, it's not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ the gospel of Christ and the dispens ultra, the hyper dispensationalists would tell you, see, it says the gospel of Christ. That's different. The gospel of Christ is different than the everlasting gospel preached by the, by the angel in heaven. Uno momento por favor. 
Verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven. Wait a minute. Let me go back. Let me go back. Make sure. Make sure. Revelation 14. What were the two words I told you to underline? I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. You hold your place. Your Bible is going to look like this. Okay? You flip, 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 flip. That's how you do it. You compare scripture with scripture, spiritual things with spiritual things. But though we or an angel from heaven, like the one in Revelation 14, 6, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. According to ultra dispensational or hyper dispensational because they can't focus on anything longer than three seconds according to hyper dispensationalism or just dispensationalism and some people believe this the angel in revelation 14 6 paul just cursed that angel that's what paul did you you look at it you compare verse 7 with verse uh, of Galatians 1 to verse 6 of Revelation 14. And I was reading that, and th my, that's where my thoughts immediately went. And I went, I smell a rat here. I smell a conspiracy. I think some people lied through their teeth about this issue. Now here's what here's what I'm I'm told. I'm told that I should have listened to all of these people who tried to convince me that dispensationalism um, ergo different gospels in different ages that I needed to listen to these people who could teach me that or they could send me to the website that could prove it or they could send me the books to read so that if I read those books then I would uh, I would be illuminated like they are and I would no longer be a child sucking milk from the Bible I would be the adult that they are um, eating the meat of the Word of God here's my problem in all the encounters that I've had with the very hyper of dispensationalists, not one of them, not one of them has ever told me, Pastor Mike or Mike or Hogwash or any other the names that they've called me, they've never said to me, Pastor or Mike, if you will just open your Bible and read that Bible, you will see it plainly in the scriptures. Here are the, the places that you go to. They don't do that. They want, to, they want me to go watch a video or read somebody's book or listen to somebody's teaching on it or just to follow their, their argumentative line without Scripture. I'm not doing that, and I don't think you should either. If anybody's got some kind of doctrinal axe to grind with you, and they keep referring you to some other man or some dude or some video or some book you've got to read, There's there that may not be the right thing. In fact, probably it's not the right thing to do. Why don't you just get your Bible out? If somebody's questioning what you're believing, then go to your Bible and just say, this is what I believe right here. Paul, Paul, according to Paul, he cursed the angel in Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, because this angel, according to them, has a different gospel than the one Paul preached. And that's what Paul specifically said, word for word. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And I'm, I'm going to say this politely, gently, with fear and love. I am afraid for people who buy into this stuff that there is an opposing gospel 
that does not look like the gospel that you and I have right now, that there is an opposing gospel. I am afraid for these people. Not, I'm not afraid of them. I'm afraid for them. Because these are supposedly King James Bible believers who for some reason have some stony ground in their heart and they are actually they have they have no hesitation whatsoever of declaring to people that there is more than one gospel it doesn't bother them in the least bit to to say that i'm afraid of that i'm afraid for that i'm afraid for the people who will believe that who will say of course i believe in another gospel i'd go back and read galatians 1 again and again, and again, and again, and hopefully maybe it'll sink in that you're not doing the right thing. So I go back to Psalm 120. In my distress, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me, because I have, I have, and I still do it. I have people who, who have different ideas and different beliefs than maybe what I do or maybe what I was taught as a young man or whatever, and it distresses me. Doctrine means a lot to me. And it distresses me when I think that maybe I, I, I'm wrong or and how I believe or how I see something. And I want to know the truth. God, God knows my heart. You can judge me however you want to, but God knows my heart. I want to know the truth. And I want God to deliver my soul from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. And look at verse 3. What shall be given unto thee, or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Oh, I like this. Go, go read verse 4. I'll give you about a minute to read verse 4. If when you read verse 4 of Psalm 120, you immediately thought of Isaiah, you're right. Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. Isaiah admitted that he was a man of unclean lips. And so an angel, one of these priest angels of the order of Melchizedek, went over to the altar, took a coal with the tongs, and he put it on Isaiah's lips, and he purged his lips. Now God said, speak. And Isaiah said, you just tell me what to speak, and I'll do it. God cleansed him. I am a liar. I admit it. I am. Where is that? I read things to you from the Internet that are not true. And when somebody says, Pastor, you should have done your own work on that one. Yeah, I should have. I let that one slip. I'm sure, I am reasonably sure that since 2009, the first Watchmen video broadcast that ever came out in January 2009, I am reasonably sure that I've said things. In those videos, Pastor Mike Online's Pure Bible Studies, Wednesday Night Bible Studies, Sunday School, Sunday Morning, Sunday Night, Revival Meetings, Far Fargo, Fargo Conference. Where are you? Fargo Conference. <sighs> um, I am going to be in Fargo, North Dakota, March 26th, 27th, 28th. Actually, the conference starts Friday morning, 27th, 28th, and March 29th. Um, I will be speaking there about four times. The website is Titus213hope.com. You can go to my website, PastorMikeHoggard.com, and I have the link there to that website if you are interested in coming. I'd love to see you. I've, ha I've heard from several people said they're going to be there. Uh, looking forward to seeing some of our Canadian friends, eh, down from Saskatchewan, eh? And... Um, Looking forward to seeing some of those again. We have a good time down there, and I will tell you that not everybody at that conference is KJB. Uh, and, and I'm meaning the speakers and some of the people. Um, and I don't have a problem at all going to. They have invited me now for the last three years. And I, and I am a servant when I go up there. And they've never told me. In fact, I, I won't get into the whole story, but they've told me, Pastor, we like you. We like what you say. You preach that book and do what God tells you to do. That's what we want. And it's run by some several pastors in that area, and I think some laymen. But, but it's a great conference. It really is. And I'm looking forward to uh, this year. 
Uh, there is, I can't remember his name, one of the guys from Lighthouse Trails Research who does all this stuff on contemplative spirituality and all this stuff. He's going to be there as well, and I'm looking forward to meeting him and visiting with him. And I've, I've learned some things that he's uncovered and used it in our ministry, and it's just been a blessing. I'm looking forward to it, and I'd like for you to be there March 27th, 28th, 29th of this year. Titus213hope.com is the website. They give you the schedule. And uh, it will. They usually stream it, and uh, so you'll have to look for the link to streaming it, all right? Anyway, uh, no matter what conference I go to, no matter where I speak or whatever, I have no idea what I was going to talk about now. Oh, do I? No, I don't remember. I don't remember. I, I can just say that I've probably said things that were not true. I don't mean to. I have somewhat of a limit under, limited understanding on some issues. And I've probably said some things that are not true. I don't want that. So what I want God to do is put a hot coal on my lips and purge my lips so that what I say is according to thus saith the Lord God. And the best way that I know how to do that is to just quote Bible verses. And um, But anyway, I, I am like a lot of other people. I just ask God and beg God, God, don't let anybody lie to me. Or if they do, deliver me from those lying lips. I want no part of it. I don't want anything to do with it. I don't want to be lied to. Um, Brother Dave Bradley, he is in Rome now. If you watched our Sunday evening service, I'll let him speak. Outstanding presentation on uh, dissolving doubts. I like his, I like his, uh, his mannerism, the way, the way he presented it. I'm not going to tell you what it was. You'll have to watch the video. But he just informed me that he's landed in Rome, and him and his family like to go out there every year right around Easter time so they can pass out tracts to all the Roman Catholics that show up at the Vatican. These are the people, these are the people who have been given over to lying lips and deceitful tongues. And they are worshiping this new pope now. They think he is the cat's meow on everything. He's, he's sort of youthful looking, even though he's in his 70s. He seems like he's got a lot of energy. He is proactive. He is very liberal. You can see that. And, of course, but I think there's a lot, a lot of Roman Catholics that are very liberal. And he's, he is reaching to them, but he's lying through their teeth. And I want you to pray for Brother Dave out there. He's out there alone for two weeks. Technically, what he's doing You're in a Catholic-controlled nation handing out gospel tracts. He needs prayer. He's going to go to Germany. He needs prayer in Germany. There's not very many saved people in Germany or Italy, in Rome, around the Vatican. So you pray for him. His family's going to join him here before too long. You pray for them. While they're absent from one another, that's a tough thing. Two weeks to be gone from your family, that's hard. I can tell you it's hard. Uh, but they're going to join them, so pray for them and lift them up. All right, will you do that? Will you do that, huh? Will you do that? Uh, let's see what's going on in the news. Somebody posted, I saw this video today, and it just, oh, my goodness. Uh, I thought about posting it on the Facebook.com slash Pastor Mike Online, and I may yet, but it's got some foul language in it. It's two young black men who are holding up some picture of Jesus, some drawing of Jesus. And they keep calling him that cracker white uh, Jesus, and they keep cursing that. And one guy's reading the scriptures, and the other guy is just going off on this stuff about how it's the black race, and it's the black race, and the black race needs to kill all the white race, and we need to kill off this... We need to... Uh, where's my button here? We need to kill off this... Jesus, this white cracker Jesus, and they keep, and finally they burn the picture. And you can see nation against nation in this video. You can see it. It's just seething out of it. There is, I, I'll, instead of having a black president that could have brought all of the people of America together. Instead of that, we have now, here is an article. 
Where is this from? I got to make sure it's not from theonion.com. Yahoo News. This is Yahoo News. Missouri Lieutenant Governor, he was quoted as saying there's more racism in the in the Justice Department than in the St. Louis area. And that's obviously referring to Ferguson. By the way, they caught the guy that shot two white police officers standing in front of the Ferguson City Hall during protests the other night. They caught the guy. He was he was black. He's trying to convince them that he was simply shooting into the air. And, of course, the bullets hit dead on on their target. Shot one officer in the face. It lodged in here not too far. Another inch either way, we'd have been having a funeral of a dead cop. He survived, shot the other one in the shoulder. They're both out of the hospital, recovering. They caught the guy, and he's trying to say, I'm just shooting up in the air. Missouri's lieutenant governor lashed out at the Justice Department on Monday, accusing U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder and the Obama administration of racism in the wake of the fatal police shootings of Michael Brown, an unnamed black teenager in Ferguson last year. Here's the quote. There's more racism... Uh, in the Justice Department than in the St. Louis area, Peter Kinder said in an interview with Newsmax TV Monday. We're making progress. We've come an, an enormous way in 50 years. That's not to say we don't have still have more to do, but it is the left. It is Eric Holder and the, and the Obama left. He's talking about the left wing. And their minions who are like Al Sharptong, who are obsessed with race, while the rest of us are moving on beyond it. And I absolutely agree with that. I want to get along with everybody. And at our church, we do. We have a mixed racial group in our church, and we get along. Do you know why? Because we're not calling each other names. Hey, cracker preacher. We don't do that in our church. We love one another. We're brethren. We love Jesus. We love the word of God. We know that it doesn't matter if it's black or white. We're messed up. And we need a savior. And thank God we've got one. But Obama, um, Eric Holder, and all of the minions out there, uh, Al Sharpton, Jesse Jackson, people have rightly called them race baiters, poverty pimps, names like that, because that's all they're, they're about gaining power and control and money by pitting one race against another. Agent provocateurs they are. If they would just leave us alone... We work side by side, people of different races working side by side, sitting on the bus, talking to one another, going to church services. We don't want to keep stirring up. We want to we want to do what Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. There's always somebody. Kinder, a Republican, criticized the administration for inciting a mob during the protests that followed Brown's killing. The whole blow up of this protest movement was based on the lie that never happened of hands up, don't shoot, Kinder said in remarks that were first reported by BuzzFeed. It's bad enough the protesters were behaving that way, but we have we have a right to expect much more from the attorney general, the head of the Justice Department of the United States and the president of the United States. And instead, what we got too often from them was incitement of the mob, encouraging disorder in Ferguson and disrupting the peaceable going about of our daily lives in the greater St. Louis region. And I can tell you, we didn't have a problem before Mike Brown. Maybe it's, I don't live in St. Louis area. I live south of that in Jefferson County. We don't have a problem with it in Jefferson County. My, uh, my son's basketball coach for the YMCA is black. We have a winning, we have a winning season. We haven't lost a game yet. I love that guy. He's good with those. I don't care. I don't. I don't go. Well, I don't know that a black guy could be a good basketball coach, but I guess I'll try. I didn't think that. Never, never. 
occurred to me. And I agree with all of this. Anyway, there there is racism everywhere. It's, yes, there are white racists in America. They are they have places of position and positions of authority, and they have a big mouth. But it's also the same going the other way as well. Uh, yeah, here is apparently these two young black men on YouTube. You remember the ice bucket challenge? Well, they've started the burn white Jesus challenge. Um, this is dated March 16, 2016. William Gein of Americans for Legal Immigration PAC is releasing this video today to prove a point that America's media will censor or suppress information regarding bias, crimes, threats, and violence against Caucasians while simultaneously deceiving audiences and aggrandizing narratives depicting white gun owners victimizing minorities. The following video is being sent to media across America, including Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, CBS, ABC, New York Times, Washington Post, Miami Herald. The video is called Burn White Jesus and All White People in America. And that's what was said by the two young men. Not only burn the white cracker Jesus, but burn all white people in America. And they were using, they were justifying with God. Now, that's the same thing that the KKK gets accused of, and, and rightfully so, they get accused of this. The KKK and all white racist, white supremacist groups love to use the Bible as their mode or their apology for hating everybody. That's why British Israelism or Christian identity or if you're white Caucasian, you're the 10 lost tribes. That's why that doctrine, number one, is so heretical. Number two, it's so dangerous because it seeks only to, to exalt the white man as being the only real human that God can save. All of the West, rest of the races on the earth are seeds of Satan, the, the uh, marked seed of Cain that somehow survived the flood and they're not really human, so we don't have to love them. We don't have to witness to them. We don't have to. We can. All we have to do is hate them, and kill them when we can think we can get away with it. Same thing going on, in in black circles in this country. Same thing. So anyway, this this video was found on the YouTube channel titled. Um, uh, I'm not even going to pronounce that, but anyway, its original title was "Burn a Cracker Jesus Challenge." It depicts two black males joining the internet phenomenon known as Burn White Jesus Challenge, which is modeled after the massively successful Ice Bucket Challenge that swept the nation. The presenters call on others to burn pictures of Jesus and claim that such actions symbolize the fate of America as they advocate a violent genocidal campaign against white Americans. Now, here's, here's why I think this is relevant. And I think it is. Uh, number one, this, this article, basically, the title of the article was in MSNBC, or was it, who was it, uh, they said, censored by mainstream media, and I can't remember who they said didn't post it. They censored it. They took it down. Um, I don't remember any one, one of those news organizations. And here's why this is relevant. Here's why I think it means something. Um, number one, Jesus did say nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That idea of nation, we can, you look at it, you just look at it in the Bible. Nation against nation is ethnic against ethnic. Your, your DNA variants against our DNA variants. Because you are less people because of the variants of your DNA than I am because of the variants of my DNA. My DNA is superior to your DNA. And, and that's at the core of it. I do have this idea that I think it means more than that. I think it means us as a holy nation against everybody that is of an evil nation. I, I think that that's part of it. But anyway, here's why I also think it's relevant. I think, I think we're seeing some things right now. Um, I'm not saying I predicted this because I didn't really know what was going to happen when Obama was elected. But I, I did a talk uh, down in Harrison, Arkansas, um, and it was uh, – what video was it? 
uh, Baphomet, the God of Transformation. If you've not seen that, uh, take a look at it. Baphomet, the God of Transformation. And I was going through all the symbols and signs that was on Baphomet and what they all represented and so on. And you have the idea of, of opposites. You know, he's got this hand going up this way and this hand going out this way. And this hand arm says salve, which means dissolve it. And this arm says coagula, which means that way you can build it back together. It's the, it's, uh, the, the principles of alchemy, how you can turn lead into gold. And, but you look at it from a wider spiritual view. How do you turn the old world into the new world? Got to burn the old world. You got to get rid of it. It has to dissolve. It has to fade away. That way you can recoagulate a new world order. Um, how do you change America from being a Bible believing Christian nation based upon the Constitution? How do you change that nation to be, to be part of a global conglomerate where we sell our rights and our liberties and everything about us over to the collective? How do you, because Americans, we all have guns and we all are fiercely independent. That's what, that's us. That's our nation. That's, that's who we are. It comes out in our, comes out in, in everything, comes out in sports. It comes out in our religions. It comes out in everything. How do you do that? Well, there's this principle known as the Hegelian dialect. I'm sure that you've heard of it. You're f familiar with it. Um, you, you might even think you came up with the idea, all right? But it's the idea um, that you, if you want a new system in place, if you want that in place, you have to destroy the old system. Think of those towers, and I'm trying to turn my... It's cool in every other part of this building except in this room. And some of you are saying, well, if you're hot, take your jacket off. No, my shoulders get cold. I don't like it. But anyway, think of the two towers, not in Lord of the Rings. Think of the two towers in lower Manhattan on September 11th, 2001. The symbolism is obvious to me. Let's bring down the old world so we can build a new one. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't have to. I don't have to believe that there were bombs in all those buildings. I don't have to believe that George Bush was secretly flying those planes by remote control. I don't have to believe that it was um, um, who was the secret of uh, the uh, vice president, Dick Cheney. I don't have to believe that it was Dick Cheney that that actually had part of it. I don't have. I that those all may be true. But going after those, to me, you're short-sighting yourself on what's really going on. Look at the spiritual angle of this. It represents the breaking down of what is the American fabric, piece by piece, so you can build a new world order in the new world. And so here it is, this new Freedom Tower, 1,776 feet tall. Dun, dun, dun. And the, the top part of it, the mast, has all these as above, so below triangles on them. I mean, you can just look at you can see the symbolism of it. Uh, the old world decaying and the new world coming up. Well, think of it. This is what Frederick Hegel realized. If you want it, anything new you want to do, you've got to destroy the old. The best way to destroy the old is to take two opposing ideas, synth or thesis and antithesis, and get them to clash like, like uh, quantum particles in a hadron collider. You've got to get them to clash together. And fire has to ignite them, and it's got to destroy both of them. And out of that, a little phoenix bird comes flying out. And he's the new world order. That's, that's the thesis clashing against antithesis. You get synthesis. And that's what Baphomet represents. He is a god of transformation. It's about getting the opposites to clash, and I don't care what area of life or 
civil politics or whatever that's in, even in religion. Here is, I'll, I'll just say it like I see it. Um, Finnis Dake, um, I just mentioned his name while ago, dispensational Clarence Larkin, and many of these others believe in a pre-Adam uh, earth and race that was created between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-1-2. And it's funny to hear these talk because they don't refer to the first chapter of Genesis as the creation week. They call it the recreation week because they believe that the earth is actually older, billions of years older. Where did they get that from? Where did they get the notion that the earth was billions of years old? They didn't get it from the Bible. They got it from Charles Darwin and everybody that came after him who started saying the earth is not 6,000 years old. It's actually millions and billions of years old. And see, we have all these rocks that prove that and we have all this stuff. And at some point, somebody tried to take these two opposing ideas and blend them together. And you have a new synthetic doctrine called the gap theory. And it was an attempt to mingle billions of alleged years of the earth's existence with the Bible story of the creation or the recreation in one week. They just blended them together. And now this, you have this synthetic doctrine called the gap theory, pre-Adamite race stuff. And it's not in the Bible anywhere. It is an opposing theory to what's in the Bible. Because they even talk about 2 Peter chapter 2 is saying, see, it, it, it's what it is. And, you know, he said the earth was that, that then was, was out of the water and into the water. And I heard one guy saying, yeah, you know, in the gap, in that during that time, it was bobbing up and down in the water. It says that in 2 Peter. And I'm going, oh, come on. It's obviously referring to the flood of Noah, but they don't see it that way. So they fuse these two ideas together, and this is what's going on in our country. It was working. The American dream was really working. Because the people whose ancestors at one time were slaves, brutally treated in this nation. It took years but we were finally in a place where we were working side by side. And we were finally in a place where we were having children, grandchildren of mixed race, and we were loving them. We were working side by side. We were, we were gonna vote for black candidates or white candidates. We were watching sports events and the, the athleticism of, of some black guys on a basketball court. We were going, how do you do that? How does Michael Jordan leap up at the half court, fly through the air with the ball in his right hand, headed to a slam dunk city, and at the last millisecond, change the ball into his left hand and slam it in behind him as he flies past the goal. How do you do that? And we're going, Jordan's the best, man! We don't, we, we don't even say, well, you know, he's black, but I think he's okay. We don't do that. It was working pretty good. People were starting to get along. But there, there are evil people in this nation who don't have anything else to do other than to just stir up piles of manure. There are people in this country who have chosen a life of empowering themselves and financially gaining for themselves. And how they do it is to further separate the races and then say, see, whites really do hate us blacks. But for them, people just find a way to get along. And we were. But these guys aren't going to let us. They're not going to let us. They're going to keep stirring it up. And at some point, <laughs> fusion, a new synthetic nation whose God is not the Lord and whose law is not the Constitution. 
Moving right along. Speaking of New World Order, remote control cyborg beetles now flying with greater precision. A giant flower beetle flying with an electronic backpack. There are few better ways to answer a question than by building a cyborg to solve it. Researchers at UC Berkeley, I don't see the Wyoming Institute of Technology listed here. Researchers at UC Berkeley and Nanyang Technology University in Singapore wanted to know how beetles steer themselves in flight, so they did the only logical thing. They strapped an electronic backpack to a giant flower beetle, let it fly, and recorded the results. This isn't the first time humans have remotely controlled flying beetles, but a new discovery in this study means scientists are getting better at controlling their buggy bots. The researchers found that more muscles are involved in steering the beetle's flight than previously thought. A small muscle on the wing that scientists thought only controls wing folding is also used by the beetle to change direction midair. Armed with that knowledge, the team built a cyborg beetle, which means a robot, that they were able to steer with greater precision than ever before. Now, I got a verse. I got a verse for that. I got one. It's in Romans. It's in Romans chapter 1, and we're going to read it. Uh, yeah, Romans chapter 1, because I'm, I'm looking at this, and I'm going, okay. They wanted to know how to make their creation better, so they decided to reverse engineer God's creation. They stole the idea. It's like some chicken company that hires very, very, very talented taste testers to take Colonel Sanders Kentucky Fried Chicken and eat it until they figure out what his 11 secret herbs and spices are. They're going to reverse engineer the Colonel's recipe, which is good chicken. you got to admit it. But anyway, here's what they did. Here's according to God. According to God, here's what they did. I'm in the wrong book. I said Romans. Why in the world did I turn to Acts? I'll never know. Okay, here's what they did. Hang on here. Yeah, yeah, here, here we are, here we are, here we are. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. Imagination, think about it. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. That is the Wyoming Institute of Technology. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. That's what they did. They stole it from God. They looked at the beetle and how it flew, and they said, well, that's what we're going to do then. Only we're going to do it better than God did. What else? A police gadget tracks phones. Powerful new surveillance tool being adopted by police departments across the country comes with an unusual requirement. To buy it, law enforcement officials must sign a non-disclosure agreement preventing them from saying almost anything about the technology. That just kind of um, shuts the door on the government operating in the open. Who was it? Jack Kennedy? John Kennedy? Same guy, by the way. Jack and John were the same guy. You know how I know? Never saw them both in the room together. Okay? John Kennedy. There's a speech. You can find it on YouTube. A famous speech about secret societies working in America and in government. And, he's, and he was a Democrat and a philanderer and a drunk. But he was warning about secret societies working in America and in American government. And he's saying, and you got to go listen to it. He said, basically, he said, here, he said, we have a, supposed to have an open society. 
And he said it's against our very principles as Americans to have people in places of government that are operating in secret. It's not right. His predecessor, Eisenhower, days before he is done being in office, he makes this little speech on camera saying there's a there's a big power thing growing in America and it's going to turn out to be one of the dangerous things that's ever happened in this country and he's the one that said military industrial complex and he was a general and he knew it he knew that tons and tons of money was being poured into this military apparatus in the United States of America and that it was basically feeding on itself when we don't have a good war to go to we'll just make one somewhere here, JFK was going to withdraw troops from Vietnam, was going to break up and bust up the CIA. All of a sudden, he's laying dead in his car. And his the guy that followed him in, LBJ Johnson, immediately upon swearing the oath of office, gets to Washington, D.C. and starts undoing what JFK did. Oh, we need our troops back. We need our troops back in Vietnam is what we need. I'm just telling you. So here the police department, they're getting new technology, but they're being forced to sign a non-disclosure agreement saying, if you say one word to the people of this country about what we just sold you, why? We don't have to tell you what could happen, do we? The confidentiality has elevated the stakes in a long-standing debate about the public disclosure of government practices versus law enforcement's desire to keep its methods confidential. While companies routinely require non-disclosure agreements for technical products, legal experts say these agreements raise questions and are unusual given the privacy and even constitutional issues at stake. Let me just throw something in here. I got a thought. We're used to now in America of every stoplight in America having a camera on it, aren't we? We're used to that. And the initial idea of putting video cameras at stoplights and intersections on highways and streetways and roadways and subdivision ways and backways and slantways and everything else kind of ways, we were, the initial idea was to help law enforcement uh, control traffic because we see people running stoplights and they're killing people and so we want to help these cities this these companies that run these things we want to help these cities get this under control so we're gonna put a camera on there and anybody caught running a red light we're gonna send them a ticket and they're gonna have to pay it and now that's gonna help us because we're gonna get a piece of the pie and that's gonna help the city and it's gonna get millions and millions of dollars and it works but now there's lawsuits all over the country on these red light cameras and these judges are going you know they, they make a good point you take a picture of the car and the license plate but how in the world do you know who was behind the wheel and that that was the defense a lot of these guys were getting tickets in the mail and they weren't even driving the car that day. Maybe they loaned it to a friend. Maybe maybe their kid took it out for a ride or whatever. Maybe it was their mother-in-law. Well, mother-in-law can pay the ticket for crying out loud. And these guys would show up at court and say, I wasn't in that car and I'm not paying the ticket. And so now in, in the state of Missouri and other places, they're, they're, they're ruling these things unconstitutional. You can't do that. The cameras are not going away. They're up there, and they're working, and they're doing what cameras do. They are leopards overseeing a city. Go look that up in your King James Bible. They're leopards watching, watching to see what's going on. That's one of the powers of the beast, by the way. And so anyway, here's, here's the technology now that they have. Let me see if I can find it here and shorten this story just a little bit. The technology goes by various names, including Stingray, Kingfish, or generically, Cell Sight Stimulator. It's a rectangular device small enough to fit into a suitcase that intercepts a cell phone signal by acting like a cell phone tower. You've heard of that. The technology can also capture 
text messages, calls, emails, and other data. Some of you know what that is. And prosecutors have received court approval to use it for such purposes. Cell site simulators are catching on while law enforcement officials are adding other digital tools like video cameras. Told you. License plate readers. You know what that is? Cops going down a city street doing about 30 miles an hour. He's got a license plate camera on the front of his car that as cars pass him going the other way, their license plate camera captures an image of the license plate, takes the numbers off of it, feeds it into the database of where this car was at this time of day on this date. And oh, by the way, if the driver has an open warrant, then we know to pull him over. That's what that is. Um, Let's see here. Uh, license plate readers, drones, programs that scan billions of phone records, and gunshot detection sen sensors. You know what that is? Your cell phone, mine, it's listening all the time. Right? Google, Cortana, Siri, these TVs now that are activated by voice, you don't have to clap your hands twice to activate the voice activation system because it's listening all the time and it's hearing you and taking your speech converting it to text at the main server and storing the text what a world we live in open government and now now the um Spy-in-Chief, the United States President, Barack Hussein, has decided that the White House is now exempt from Freedom of Information Act inquiries. Freedom of Information Act. There's a bill passed in Congress, signed by El Presidente. I don't remember who did it. Freedom of Information Act that basically said... Um, what did it say? I just drew a blank. The people have a right to know what goes on inside our government halls. If a city administrator writes an email to, I don't know, another city alderman or council meeting or something like that, that we have a right to know because he is a public servant, he is elected and paid by us. We're the boss. We have a right to know what that email said. We have a right to know what his letters say. We have, if he's given us a, a, a city-issued cell phone or a government-issued cell phone, we have a right to know who he called, what he talked about, what text messages he sent, what pictures he's looking at on the Internet. We have a right to know. Freedom of Information Act. Now the White House. Barack Hussein, in 2008, swore to everybody that his would be the most open and honest administration in human history. And he's just now declared that from here on out, while he's president, the White House will not participate in Freedom of Information Act inquiries to anything that they say and do and who they have coming into the White House and how much money they gave to certain persons of Middle East persuasions. Barack just told you, you have no right to ask me any question. How dare you? I'm the president. I can do and say whatever I want to. You won't know that I did and said it, and I don't have to tell you. I don't, I, I just, the country we live in is not the one that I dreamed that, that I would live in. Here's another one. U, United States intelligence report scrapped Iran from list of terror threats. Really? Bibi Netanyahu came over here and told us Iran is a terrorist nation. They're going to blow Israel up with nuclear bombs. And Barack says, uh, BB, I'll be right with you, maybe. I don't know. In seven years, 
I'm on the phone with the Germans. And that's what happened. Let's move on. Uh, oh, the supermoon. Solar eclipse supermoon, spring equinox. Friday we'll see three rare celestial events, none of which have anything to do with anything in the Bible, I think. That, that, made, that made that real easy. This weekend is the vernal equinox. I could talk about that. I may talk about that Thursday, what it represents. The supermoon, which the moon is going to be both full and at its closest apogee to the world. So it's going to be big. And then there's going to be a solar eclipse. But I think you have to be up at the North Pole to see it. All three are going to happen on the same weekend. And so that causes everybody to go, oh, the rapture, it's going to happen. There's going to be a seven-year peace treaty uh, signed with Israel this weekend because of the, the, the stuff in the moon. And I'm just going, meh. Uh, U.S. reform, I'm going to get to the point here in a little bit. Um, people have been sending me stuff about the beast. I better get moving on here. U.S. reform, Jewish rabbis install first openly lesbian leader, New York. As a rabbinic student in 1980s New York, Denise Egger lived away from other seminarians. She qu uh, quietly started a group for fellow gay and lesbian students, but held the meetings in another borough. By the time of her ordination, she wasn't formally out, but her, it uses a word here, I don't like the word, I'm going to use another word. Her psychological condition um, was known uh, and no one would hire her. Later, she took the only job offered with a synagogue formed expressly as a religious refuge for sodomites. Since then, the Reformed Jewish movement, Egger's spiritual home since childhood, has traveled a long road toward recognition and embracing same-sex relationships. That journey has led this week to Philadelphia, where Egger will be installed Monday as the first openly gay president of the Central Conference of something and that these stupid ads covered up my paper i have no idea what it says now uh edgar founding rabbi of congregation koi ami in los angeles isn't the first openly gay or lesbian clergy person to lead an american rabbinic group in 2007 reconstructionist rabbinical association chose rabbi toba spitzer <laughs> A lesbian as its national president, but reformed Jews with 2,000 rabbis, 862 American congregations, compromise the largest movement in American Judaism, have a broader role in the Jewish world. Do, and think about it. Does it seem odd, out of, sort of out of place for a Jew to be a sodomite? Go read the Old Testament. That's all you got to do is read the Old Testament. Go read during the history of Israel, during the times of the kings, from, let's say, uh, Rehoboam and Jeroboam on, and you're going to see it over and over and over again. The Sodomites, and the Sodomites were there, and the Sodomites were over there by the temple, and then he didn't put out the Sodomites, and he became a Sodomite. That's what you see in the Old Testament, and those, those were the people of Israel. By the way, I think one of the strongest um, Sodomite presences, if that's a word, in the entire world is in the nation of Israel. Um, let me do this. Let me show you. know, I'm not even. I'm not even ready for this. Let me click this button, which is going to make that pop up appear, and it's going to give me this little thing down here, which I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to undo that, and I'm going to minimize it, and then let me show you this picture this was sent in by one of our watchers i think tvmr sent us that um you obviously see you know the uh, the one eye thing and the word beast that is if you're not looking at the hunk guy there okay anyway that's what you see this is uh, apparently some sort of um exercise program champion bodybuilder clinical nutritionist superstar fitness model saggy it's his name saggy 
Hey, Saggy, how you doing? I'm not Saggy. Let me make you a beast, he says. Whenever someone gets serious about getting really built, they turn to Saggy Kalev. He's the go-to guy for anyone who needs to burn fat and build muscle. Professional physique models, actors, and bodybuilders pay thousands to get results from his proven body transforming training method. But you won't have to pay thousands because we put it in a box so you can get built like a beast at home. Now, is this some sort of isolated little um, marketing ploy where they're trying to get everybody to... Pay attention to this. Let me make you like a beast and so on. It got me thinking about some other things that I had seen relating to marketing advertisements, commercials, different things like that about, you know, being a beast. Here's one. Uh, Barber Shaves and Trims says, Tame the Beast. And their picture is, oh, look, oh, look, not only is he a bear, he's got a handlebar mustache. That's pretty cool. I never saw that before. Here's another one. You've seen these commercials, haven't you? Feed the wild side. It's these guys that they're going around their different areas of life, and they're all starving. And they've got a stomach that's growling, and all of a sudden protruding out of their stomach is some vicious, angry, hungry, starving, wild beast thing that's inside of them that needs to be fed. you got to feed the beast. I think that is um, Jack Link's because, yeah, here's another one here. Feed your wild side with a picture of a Sasquatch, all right, and a bull with the horns. That's pretty interesting. Here's another one. I've got a video, too, to show you. Tame the Beast. Grooming products for men. Going to tame the beast. What else here? There, let's go back to that. Let me see if I can successfully pull up. Oh, that one. Yeah. You got to wait and see this one. This was actually what, what, what kind of got me thinking about it. I was looking at those graphics there. Let me click back on this again. I was looking at those graphics, and somebody sent me a link to a YouTube video to watch, and so I hit it, and you know how those advertisements come up on YouTube now. you got to watch a commercial first. Some of them, you got to watch the whole commercial. Some of them, you can skip this ad in five, four, three, two. And I was looking at this one going, oh, wait, 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 wait. I'm not going to skip this. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. I remembered, let me see if I can separate this. I can grab it and come over here with it. Yeah, there we go. That worked out pretty cool. This is um, a Chef Boyardee commercial. Tame the Beast. Let me click this button here and you can see it. Chef Boyardee. Let me back up here on this thing. And I'm going to play it. You won't be able to hear the sound, but I'm going to play it anyway. Boy riding his bike. Boy traveling fast. He's got horns coming out of his head. Now magically, in his backyard, he turns into a horned beast. Ah! And he must eat ravioli to cure his beasthood. And, of course... It works. Tame da beast. All right. All right. Now let's get rid of that one. And I have another one here. Let me bring it over here. Here we go. This one. It's you got to see this one. In fact, I'm going to do something. Let me do this. Let me turn on the sound. On this one. 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 Hang on. Okay. Oh, I I remember what I gotta do now. I gotta click this. All right now. Now I'm gonna click that. Now it's gonna capture the audio. You gotta watch this video. And there's like this is from Ziploc. These people make bags 
Okay, they make bags. They make plastic bags, and apparently, I guess there's so much competition in the plastic bag wars that they've got to really come out ahead of their competitors by making. There's like a one, two, three, four, five, six. Of course, six commercials. Ziploc presents little beasts. Listen to listen to how it starts out. It's like creepy. Little beast, little beast, little beast, little beast. Um, Let me do that again. Little beast, little beast, little beast, little beast. Um, mornings at our house are pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, getting our son out the door is well, it's complicated. He's bizarrely slow. You know what? That's perfect. Because today's slow motion day. Who likes shirts? Where are the shoes? Here's the shirt. Here's the shirt. We, where do the pants go? Dun, 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 dun. Four, three. You got to get in the car. Two, Two one. one. That's He's not... the end of the numbers. So I so always good. wanted to be a dad. Um, you know, and I had like dreams of throwing the ball in the yard with the kid, and those aren't happening yet, but. Okay. I mean, we have to turn children into little beasts. Let me unclick that and do that so I can now hear what's going. There we go. The whole, I mean, the idea is kind of funny. Okay. But the, the singing there by the little children, little beast, little beast, little beast, little beast. Now, I will tell you this. You and I both know we've been to the doctor's office or the grocery store, and we've seen the little beast running around. It won't behave. So we've seen that happen. But it seems to me that there is this heavy promotion of the idea of beasthood into our thinking. Am I just overreaching on this? I don't think so. Let me read you sola scriptura. Let me give you some word here. Um, obviously, let me go to these two verses here because I've used them at different times and different teachings and so on. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, but these as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed speak evil of the things that they understand not and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. And Jude one ten. but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things, they corrupt themselves. Now what you'll see, and, and you can just do a, a video search, a YouTube video search in this or whatever, a web search on it. You'll find this, this notion of the beast within. You've got this beast inside of you, and he needs to be either tamed or he needs to be fed or he needs his pen changed or he needs to be unleashed. You've got this beast in you that's he's pulling on the chain, and why don't you just let the beast go and unleash that? And what it sounds like to me, is the word faith charismatic and it's even beyond that it's in it's in some of these emerging churches where they're always talking about this thing that is inside of you this hero that's inside of you this champion in you lakewood church joel olstein their theme song discover the champion in you you've got this the only place in the bible where champion is used 1 Samuel 17, Goliath was the champion, my friend. He's the champion that needs, and think about the song I just sang by Queer. I mean, Queen. The Freudian slip was showing, wasn't it? The song that Queen made famous, we are the champions, my friend. We'll keep on fighting to the end. The only place in the whole Bible the word champion used, 1 Samuel 17. Samson, or excuse me, Goliath. <laughs> what was I thinking? Goliath 
the giant, the hybrid, half human, half beast. His great grandfather, or however far back it goes, I think, I think the Bible's telling us that Goliath. The Bible t- says that he was the son of the giant. Was that Anak? Could be Anak had a heavy presence in the in the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, and other places like that. Um. Og. Anak, I think, was the son of what was that other what was that other giant's name? He's mentioned in the Bible specifically by name. A um, oh boy, I had a tip of my tongue. Some of you will probably know what I'm talking about. But anyway, at some point, a fallen evil angel that left its first estate fell from heaven and mated with a human woman whom he took to be his wife. These devils, I believe, are of a beast sort. They have a beast nature about them. Um, And I'm going to read something very, very relevant to this here in just a minute because I think it means something. And so here's Lakewood Church telling you, you're going to release this champion that's locked up inside of you. He's in there and he wants out and we're going to help you discover who the real champion in you, who the real beast is in you, your own potential hidden, uh, trapped in it. And it's need to be released. It's like the, like the new age healers, uh, who tell you that you've got these energies these chi energies inside of you and they will heal every disease in your body and they will heal broken bones and they will put together uh, unattached tendons and things like that and that's what I was told that I was told not to have surgery on my tore up right shoulder from the electrocution and I had I had tendons and muscles that were in the wrong place. And I had one tendon that was arched over a piece of bone, a bone spur in my shoulder that every time I raised my arm, it was sawing my tendon. And I was told that if I swallowed some sort of pills made out of roots and leaves and puppy dog tails and whatever, if I, if I ate that or swallowed that, then that was going to release my body's healing energies. And I'm, I'm not trying to be mean about this. I preached on it Sunday morning. I think we've got to be honest, people, and realize that not everything in the holistic health arena is holistically healthy for us spiritually. I think a lot of it is based upon new age principles. And I think that is a deadly trap. It's bondage. Don't be very, be very careful. I know some families and they are friends of mine that choose this way of life, to a, a just sort of a natural remedy type way of life. I am all for it. I've tried something. People have asked me, Pastor, will you take this bottle? Yes. Uh, there's a lady. I sent her an email. I don't know if she ever got it. She sent me a bottle of stuff to take. I don't know what it was. So I, I, okay, I'll take it. I took, took the whole bottle. I think she said she was going to meet up at Fargo. And, um, I hate to say it, but I didn't see anything happen. I didn't, you know, there's no more hair on my head than there was, you know, when I started, I still have diabetes. I still have joint aches and so on. Uh, it's sometimes it works. Everybody's different. But here's what I'm saying. You chase down this stuff. You start finding the root of it. When they start talking about the healing energies and these things that are in you that you can release and so on, I am extremely skeptical about that. And I think you should be too. I think you should ask a lot of questions and test every spirit to find out whether it's of God or not. And you know how easy that is? It'll be in the Bible. It'll be in the Bible. I remember this guy. This stuff went around years ago. I don't know what happened to him. 
He was making some of you are going, yeah, I remember that guy. The Miracle 2 soap. You remember that? It was eloptically engineered. And the word eloptically is not found anywhere in any dictionary or any place in the known universe. It was eloptically engineered, and God himself wrote the ingredients and the process of how to make this soap on a wall, and he wrote it all down. Mm. Wrong. But I had people swear, and, you'll pass, and I, heard his, I heard one of his cassette tapes. He said, it cures cancer. That's what he said. I can imagine that he's either out of business or in prison for making the claim that his eloptically engineered soap could cure cancer. Anyway, here's what I'm getting at. Everybody's talking about this beast inside of you. You got a beast. You're a beast. Listen to this. Psalm 73, 22, so foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. Here's something. I, I want you to understand what's coming. I think that the mark of the beast and the name of the beast and the number of his name, all of them working together, I think the transformation of humanity involves transforming humans with pure human DNA into at least partial beasts of a spiritual nature, of the spiritual kind. Ezekiel chapter 1, Ezekiel chapter 10, Revelation chapter 4, um, Isaiah 14, uh, Isaiah 13, where it talks about dragons. I'm going to read that in a minute. I just, you're going to, I need to get to this. But number one, we find out about them is that they're foolish and they're ignorant, which means they, the fool has said in his heart there's no God. And number two, they're ignorant of the word of God. And I think people are going to willingly accept this transformation mark that turns them into beasts, brute beasts, at least in their mind. Psalm 49, 12, nevertheless, man being an... And let me, let me stop right here. I'm trying to th think of things to talk about. And it occurs to me that almost... You hear them talking about all the time about how they're working on this process and they're changing this gene and they're doing this research because they want to cure Alzheimer's. What is Alzheimer's? It has to do with the mind. And it just seems like, I don't know, every four out of eight, that would be five out of ten. That would be 50 out of 100. A lot of these studies and these researches and these changes that they're making have to do with healing some problem in the mind like Alzheimer's. I think it's going to chafe the minds of these people. Psalm 49, 12, nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beast that perish. Psalm 40, I don't know if I should say this. Beasts perish. Uh, anyway, Psalm forty nine twenty. Man that is in honor and understandeth not is like the beast that I just read that. It's the same thing. Psalm forty nine twelve and forty nine twenty. Isn't that interesting? Ecclesiastes three eighteen. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men, that God might manifest them, and they might see that they themselves are beasts. Now Isaiah thirteen. I um. I talked about this. Let's let's open Isaiah 13. Let's open to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. The video where dragons live has that teaching and that idea from scripture has really helped me a lot. I mean it really has. Those of us that um, we work here at Bethel Prophetic Research Ministry, um, over the years we have seen, there's been times when there's been a spirit here and it wasn't holy. Um, I, I think last week and this week some kind of nasty spirit or something like that everybody here was sick 
with one exception, and that was me. And I'm not saying I'm any better than anybody else, but I'm talking, and my wife is still, see, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, she's in day four of a virus that uh, it's not upper respiratory. It's She's not coughing and sneezing, everything like that. It's the other thing. You know what I'm talking about? The other kind of virus, the flu that you get. She's in day four of that. And I, we've never seen anything like this. All of my girls were sick. Matthew was sick. All the grandchildren, sick. And it's I've we, I've never seen that before. Just I mean, a whole family sick. Everybody works here is getting sick. Um, we've had times when all of a sudden we were just at each other's throats for no reason. And then usually somebody would say, "You know what? Hold on. What are we doing in Kenya? What did you preach on last Sunday?" And then we realize there's a spirit here just trying to stir stuff up. And what you have to do at that point, when you realize it, you get your Bible out and you start reading and you start you start praying to God, and all of a sudden, whew, they go away, man. They don't like that. They don't like that man, Jesus. They leave. Do you know why they leave? Genesis chapter nine, and uh, this is really, to me, one of the best explanations of how devil spirits work and how to get rid of them. In Genesis chapter 9, um, let's see here, verse 8, God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, and I, and I behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you. It's not there, is it? Where is it? Yeah, verse 2, I missed it. Um, God blessed Noah, verse 1, and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air. And if, and if you just want this, understand the symbolism of that, go read the parable of the seed and the sower, where Jesus said the fowls of the air came and devoured the seed. Then he says, Satan cometh and devoureth the word. And he said, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air and upon all that moveth upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea. Into your hand are they delivered. And I'm, number one, you can, that means we can eat them if we want. Okay? And I like eating fish of the sea and fowl of the air. And I like eating beasts of the earth. They're, they're really good with gravy and tartar sauce. But here's the thing. Catfish never come up to the surface and say, can I get on your hook, please? Can I get on your hook? They never do that. Catfish are so sensitive. I, I, my dad tried to teach me this, and I didn't believe it till later in life, but catfish are very sensitive. And if they hear you walking around on the, on the beach or the shore, or the banks of the river, or the lake or whatever, they're gone, man. They are gone. You know why? God put a fear of us in them. Now, let's take that up one level. Beasts. Angels, devils, fallen evils, devil spirits have a beast nature. The dragon, definitely, absolutely, he's a dragon, he's a serpent, he's a beast. He has a beast nature. He is afraid of the man. And the man is Jesus Christ. That's who that is. And any time, and you, I would love to see your testimony on this. There have been times when you have sensed the presence of very evil spirits. You saw them working. You saw the chaos that was in your house. You saw me going to Kenya. I, I usually, both times I've been to Kenya, they've been all over me, and I wouldn't realize it until I was already freaking out. And then I would go, oh, I know what this is. And then here comes the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Boom. They're gone. Now I want you to keep that in your mind when we look in Isaiah chapter 13. I want you to think about it. And this really, to me, 
this makes a whole lot more sense and it's actually easier and cheaper than the thousands or so of people out there who claim that they have a ministry of spiritual deliverance and they can remove generational curses and they can do this and they can do that and they have a process by which they go by a ritual that they perform and this and that and the other to remove those curses from you correction number one if you are under the blood of jesus christ you are not under any curse period the end don't let anybody tell you that they're lying through their teeth the curses were removed at the cross all right number two most of these people i wouldn't say all of them are nothing more than um snake oil salesmen um I don't know what else to call them. They're not being honest. They have, they have this make-believe scenario that they can cast demons out, and they can do this, and they can do that, and demons are afraid of them. And I always think about the seven sons of Sceva that went in to try to exercise that, that poor guy that had all them devils in it. And, and they said, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out of this man. And then old devil turned around and looked and said, Peter, I, or Paul I know, and Jesus I know. Who are you? And that devil took those guys, beat the clothes off of them, beat them so bad that he beat the clothes off of them, and they went running out of there naked and bleeding and swelling and everything else. I, I just think that spiritual warfare and getting spirits away just seems like to me it's a lot easier in most cases a lot easier than what some people make it out to be i've had people say oh you gotta pronounce them by name this is a this is a devil a, a demon of um of curse words this is a demon of dirty house this is a the demon of um depression on mondays You've got to name that spirit by name so he'll know that you're the, he's the one you're talking to. And then you got to command him to go. And Now, I do know that there are some that this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Amen. Hallelujah. But listen to this. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. I want you, I want you to think about this now. We've covered this and where dragons live, mystery creatures of the Bible. But it just kind of really, to me, it just kind of sinks home for some reason today in verse 19 in Babylon the glory of kingdoms and the beauty of Chaldees excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah now and he said verse 20 it shall never be inhabited neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there neither shall the shepherds make their fold there do you know why it is the most barren piece of real estate in the universe it's almost like the surface of the moon. Nothing grows there. Nothing. It gets, I don't know, like a thimble full of rain, like every hundred years. There's no vegetation. There's no water wells. It's just a, a worthless piece of real estate. And there are no hotels where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. Nothing. Nobody lives there. You know why? They can't live there. They can't grow a garden there, and they can't feed sheep so they can eat the sheep there. There's nothing there. So it's never inhabited. And this is what God's going to do. Now watch this. Verse 21, But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. I want you to think about what the word house means. It's where people used to inhabit. Humanity inhabits houses. The wild beasts of the island, uh, let's see, I missed that. Verse 21, the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. The wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and dragons 
in their pleasant palaces, and her time is near to come, and her days shall not be prolonged. Look at Isaiah 34, and I'll get to the gist of it, all right? Boy, I'm almost out of time. Isaiah 34, 11, But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also and the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. Think about it. And they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there, and all her princes uh, shall be nothing. And the thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles, and the fortresses thereof, and it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satyr shall cry to his fellow, the screech owl, also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. There shall the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow. There shall the vultures also be gathered, every one with her mate. Now I'm going to stop right here. And here's what just, it just really, I think God just kind of clicked it all together. And I, you know, I've been looking at this for years thinking, yeah, you know, you get rid of, get rid of the man and then these, all these devils show up. I want you to remember now that you your physical body is the house of God. It is the temple of the living God, temple of the Holy Ghost, tabernacle where God dwells. God designed it. Revelation 4, here's the 24 elders, your ribs, your heart. Oh, Carrie. Carrie from Oklahoma, you send me those little letters every month and tell me what's going on. And I've been praying for you. I read your letters. And you said something the other day in one of your letters. I went, oh, that's the coolest thing I've seen. And I'm going, why didn't I, why, God, why didn't you give that to me? And God's going, I just did. She wrote you a letter and gave it to you. I, I might try to remember to explain myself Thursday because this was so cool. But I want you to think of it. Right now, your house, your body is inhabited by the man, Jesus. He the man. And he lives in our house. And that stupid lie that says Christians can be possessed by devils too. That's and we have to cast them out because that's why they say bad words and that's why those they're, they're that's why that woman's yelling at her husband all the time because she's got a spirit in her that needs to be cast out. No, she yells at her husband because she's rebellious. It's not a devil's fault. We don't have to cast the devil out. She needs to submit to both her husband and to the Word of God. That's her problem. But your house is your body where the Lord Jesus Christ inhabits. And as long as he's there, they're not. Who's they? The dragons and the satyrs and the owls and the vultures. Those spirits, they're not there. They don't like dwelling there. They only, listen to this now, they only like moving in when the house becomes desolate. Did you catch that? They only dwell there. They, can, they only can dwell there when the house is uninhabited by the man Jesus Christ. You ponder that. Because at some point, everybody in this world, small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, six, they're fixing to be inhabited by a beast with seven heads and ten horns. Looks like a dragon. The only way that that dragon is ever going to step foot in that house is if the, the man is gone. You think about that, all right? Sorry it took so long. Study this out, okay? Study desolation, things that are desolate in the Bible, okay? Anyway, I have the idea, this is probably the most boring Pastor Mike Online in history, but maybe not. Hope you enjoyed it. And remember, think Bible.